another fun Michael. Oops, sorry. <laughs> Welcome to another fun Paint Night Live here with Plaid Crafts in the Michaels Community Classroom. As Chanel said, I'm Chris Williams, and I'm going to be your lead teacher tonight. In the studios with me tonight, I have Stephen White. So Stephen will be here uh, monitoring the chat and uh, try to answer questions. If you have any, do write them in the chat. And if not, if he doesn't know them, then he is going to pass them along to me. So together, Stephen and I and you are going to have a great time tonight. We're going to paint a very fun slice of summer, and it's called Sweet Summer. So let's go ahead and just go overhead and get started, all right? So we are now overhead, thank you. Um, all of you had a pattern um, available in the um, supply list on the Michaels Community Classroom page, and I have mine here. I actually transferred my design already. I'll raise this up so you can see closely. I used gray graphite, and I also used an artist stylus to then transfer, trace over my design lines and transfer my pattern directly here on my canvas. I'm going to be working on wax paper palette this evening. I'm gonna bring this over so maybe we could put both in view so you can watch what I'm painting as well as watch the uh, finished hero here. People always wanna know why am I referring this to the hero? A lot of artists do that because that's your finished piece. So if I say hero and you're not sure what I'm talking about, I am talking about our finished example here. We are going to use a couple different colors tonight and the first colors I'd like to go ahead and get out onto our palette is our apple red. Apple red is going to probably give us two coats to cover our watermelon slice so I want to very quickly get a coat of apple red down on our wax paper palette tonight. So let's go ahead. I'm using the folk art multi-surface colors um, if you happen to have those, that's fine, but if you'd rather work with the um, folk art matte acrylics, that's perfect too. Apple red happens to be my one of my favorite colors. Let's see, I'm going to use a number 12 flat brush. Apple red happens to be one of my favorite bright, bright Christmassy red colors. So I'm going to go ahead and take that number 12 flat brush load both sides of that flat brush with my red. And all we're going to do, for those of you that are painting along with me, you can do the same thing right here with me. We are going to paint on the body or the meat of our watermelon. You can paint around those circles and the seeds if you have transferred those lines. So I'm just gonna use the chisel edge of my brush right now and kind of create that uh, slice edge of our watermelon. And if you'd like, um, you can go over the little um, black seed areas if you have any. I just think it might be easier for you to just go ahead and work in whatever comfort level you have. I think it's going to take us probably two coats of this apple red. So I'd like to get one coat on and move on to another section of our canvas. And then we'll come back to this second um, coat of the apple red. It does seem to be covering very nicely, so we might not need that second coat. How many people here in, are painting along with us tonight? If you are, go ahead and chat that in if you can. Take a moment and let us know if you're painting. If you just happen to be watching and you plan to paint yours later, let us know that too. It's always fun to know from where you are watching as well. And you can chat that up with Stephen and he'll look how let us know. It looks Stephen, like I do. Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. A good amount of people um, painting along with this. Oh, great. Well, this is a very simple project. It's something that I think people of all ages, all skill levels can paint. And who does not love watermelon, especially in the summer, right? But Stephen, I started to say, I've got one burning question for you and for all of our viewers tonight. Okay. Actually, I might have two, but the first one is, when you enjoy watermelon, do you cut it uh, up and eat it by a slice like this and take one big chunk out of it, like our bite over here? Or do you actually cut it all away from the rind and kind of cube it up? I think cubing it is how I eat it, but I think it's more fun to eat it in the big slices like you're painting. Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. I think the cubing makes it so much easier, but you're right. I think fun uh, with the slices is the way to go if you're at a picnic maybe, huh? 
we got a lot of people saying cubed. We got some people saying both. You know, there's no wrong way to do it, I guess. No, I think there's no, they're perfect. You're right. That's the best way to say it. No right or wrong way to enjoy watermelon. But here's my second burning question about watermelon. Do you eat it plain? Do you put salt on it or do you sugar your watermelon? The reason I ask that question is when I was younger, I lived all over growing up, but one of the places I lived was the Midwest and I lived in Indiana. And my grandmother, every time summer we'd go visit my grandparents, my grandmother always put sugar on her watermelon. But I know a lot of people will salt their watermelon. Have you ever heard of that, Stephen? Yes, I have tried it and I enjoy it. We got a lot of people saying they eat it plain though. I think I prefer mine plain. Maybe it has something to do with where you were raised. Yeah, or the thing maybe. And now watermelons, uh, as opposed to maybe when I was a child, they have seedless varieties, which is also kind of nice. I am still, if everyone's just kind of joining in, I am using a number 12 flat brush. I'm working with folk art multi-surface colors. And I am just very quickly putting color in on the meat or the body of our watermelon. My apple red is a great, beautiful, bright, vibrant red color. And that's what I am using to paint all of the body area or the meat, I guess, of the watermelon. And I'm almost about halfway around mine. If you have your heads down and you're working with me tonight, if we, you feel like at some point in time we're running too fast, please do not worry. As Chanel told you in the beginning, this class is being recorded and it will be made available on Michael's YouTube channel. Uh, within, I think, 24 hours after the class has ended. So this is something that in it, for those friends too, that are maybe not painting with us tonight, if you want to gather your girlfriends over the weekend and y'all get together to paint a slice of watermelon with me, the recording will be there available for you. Now, some people might ask me, why not paint the whole slice red first? Because obviously it'd be a lot easier to just paint over the whole watermelon red and then put the polka dots on or then later put the seeds on as after the polka dots. Well, you could do that for sure. But for a time's sake today, because we only have about an hour together, I just felt it would be easier so that you already have your pattern on and kind of ready to go. I don't know if you noticed, but the Rhine has got a checkerboard pattern to it. So whoever thought about a polka dotted watermelon slice that also has checkerboard on it, I don't know, but I think this is just such a fun piece of whimsy art, perfect for the summer. For those of you that might still be having some um, cookouts, dude, this would be a fun decoration at your food table. I just think it's just so cute and whimsy. And remember, if you have any questions, you're welcome to chat them in in the chat section. And Stephen will do his best to answer them or pass them on to me. Let us know from where you're watching. That's always fun for us to know that as well. All right, I am almost done with my red slice. And if you um, are going to continue working on yours, if you're not painting as quickly as I am now, that's quite all right. Or you can, when I stop with the red, you can stop with the red and we can move on together to the next section. You can always come back. And maybe tonight, if you, if you happen to be a person who enjoys painting a little bit slower, taking your time, maybe only paint one half of the watermelon slice. I don't want to rush you. I want everyone to work at their comfort level. And I'm just offering a couple suggestions or ideas that might be helpful to you if you don't want to feel like you are rushed. Okay. 
I think I've got mine just about done. I'm gonna to touch up a few spots here with the leftover paint that's in my brush. And now I have a red slice here of my watermelon. I did work around all of my little polka dots and I did work around a few of my seeds. And if you get your seeds a little misshapen, don't worry about it because the black is gonna definitely cover over on top of the red that we have. So right now let's go ahead, I'm just kind of wiping out some of that excess paint that's in my brush. Let's go ahead and clean that out. I've got a paper towel here on the side and I've got water in my brush basin. Do we have any questions yet? Uh, no questions right now. Okay, great. All right, I'm just gonna block that brush dry and I think I'm going to add two more colors onto my palette. So let's go ahead and get out some of the wicker white. Put a little wicker white out. And I'm also going to get out our beautiful color aqua. And we'll work on this section above the slice next. So aqua and wicker white are the two colors that you're adding to your palette. And I'm gonna to switch to a larger brush. I'm gonna to switch to a three quarter inch flat. It's larger than our 12 flat that we were just working with. And I'm going to load the full flat of the brush with my white, all right? I'm gonna flip the brush over and load more. I want more white in my brush this time than I want half and half white and our um, aqua color. So I've got mostly white in my brush, or actually all just white in my brush right now, both sides of my brush. I'm going to dip a corner of it into our aqua and y'all bring it up. You can see, oops, there we go. There you go, now you can see it. It's just a tiny little bit of aqua on there, not very much at all, because I want mostly white up here. Don't worry about my corners here where you can see there's definitely more aqua. We'll come back and darken our corners when we're all done. Right now we're looking at just kind of like this sky area and there's just touches of aqua. So what I'm going to do is I'm gonna do what we call our slip slap technique. So I'm going to put my brush down and I'm going to slip that's one way. Then I'm going to turn the brush over and slap, slip and slap and slip and slap and kind of over stroke. And you see how softly it's blending those colors. But again, mostly I have white. Very yes. little of, I'm sorry, go ahead. Uh, what colors could you combine to make uh, something close to aqua? Uh, you could use uh, any kind of a turquoisey color. Uh, if um, I have the aqua to me is kind of like a blue green color that I have on mine. But if you don't have this aqua or turquoisey blue green type colors, you could even do just blues and make it a blue sky. Uh, so any medium value blue would even work. Gotcha. Thank you. Uh huh. No, thank you for the question, Stephen. So I did transfer, I'm gonna show you, I did transfer my sweet summer words and I'm going to very lightly go over them. And as I bring that color across, I'm gonna show you the T and the E that I kind of covered. I can still see my pattern lines. So I won't have to retrace or retransfer that design um, when we get to that point. So if you are wanting to do that, you can paint over your areas. Again, it's a very light touch and use your chisel edge here when you get close to the red of your slice. Just kind of making that even there. And again, I'm just going to slice across the top with the chisel edge. Can you see that I raised it up so maybe you can see it a little bit closer. And I am very lightly using that slip slap motion that chisel edge kind of helps us keep that line straight between what would be our background and our supposed sky maybe, and our design of the top slice of the watermelon. So just refill your brush as you need to, <clears throat> white on both sides, just a tiny, tiny little bit of our aqua. And I'm using that slip slap technique. I do wanna come back in areas where maybe I see a very strong uh, strike of color that would be our aqua and I wanna blend that in. You can even pick up a little bit more white if you need to. White on both sides, a little bit more of our aqua, kind of blend on the palette here. 
and then kind of stroke that on. <clears throat> and when you get to the large S of summer, if you want, you can go up right close to it, but you can also kind of work around it. That has a large area there. So you'll be able to, I think, control your brush strokes a little bit more than trying to go around the tiny little lettering of the word sweet that was over on the other side of the canvas. And if you do get some of the paint onto the lettering, again, I think you'll be able to, if you've patterned um, with graphite, I think you'll be able to still see those pattern lines that we can do our lettering when we're all said and done. Okay, I've got my sky pretty much done. How's everybody else doing? Now, again, let me just show you this. When we bring this up, I'm asking you to don't worry about the darkening of your corners. Now we're gonna wait until this is all completely dry and we'll come back and put a little darker color on that corner there. So we're just gonna set this down now and I'm not going to actually clean my brush out right now. I'm just gonna pinch it in my paper towel to kind of remove that white and that aqua in there. And what I want us to do now is to get another color out onto our palette and that will be our classic green. Chris, I got a question for you. Perfect, thank you, Stephen. So someone said, I messed up the lettering when I transferred the pattern. So is it okay that I cover the letters up? Yes. So if you did not like how you transferred them, and let's say you did paint them over uh, and you can't see your lettering, that's perfectly fine. What you'll want to do is let this completely dry and then you can take your tracing, um, your pattern again. And once this is all dry, put your pattern back over it, use your graphite and neatly and carefully trace it and just try and be a little more careful the next time around. So yes, you can put your lettering back on. If I can, see, let me bring mine up and I'll show you. I can still see my lettering through the, my background, but if your background is heavier and you can't see your letters, that's fine. You can just repattern yourself. Does that make sense? I hope so. To me. Okay, what we're going to do next, if we look at my finished piece here, these little kind of like triangle wedges here and the lower bottom corners, this is all done with a slip slap, slip slap technique also. Again, don't mind the darkening of the corners and the edges here. We're going to use our wicker white and our classic green and just this tiny little corner, we are going to slip slap that. So that's why I didn't completely clean my brush. Same technique, we're loading this three quarter inch flat brush with our white, dipping a little bit of the corner into your green, blend a little bit on the palette. You don't want the green too, too strike, striking or too, too dark. And again, you're gonna use your chisel edge. Can you all see I've got my rind pattern here. I'm gonna go right up next to that rind with my brush and kind of create that pattern. Can you see what I did? I just kind of gave myself a cheat for that corner. And I'm gonna do the same thing. I wanna make sure you're seeing. I wanna do the same thing going up in the opposite direction. And so now I know that this is the bottom shape that I'm going to fill in. And so I'm gonna do that same thing with my white and my green, and I'm going to slip slap. And when you come up next to this area where the rind is, you can pull some of that color out. And again, we're just kind of creating a modeled effect with our green and our white, okay? Maybe add a little more green here towards the bottom. And it's gonna be very brush strokey, very model. And we'll do the exact same thing on this side. So go ahead again with that chisel edge of your brush and just go right up next to that area that's gonna be the green of our rind and give yourself that pattern line. And if any of this is not making sense, shout out the question in the chat and Stephen will pass it on to me. And we're just doing that same thing here. It's a slip slap motion of your white and your green. And we want it to be very brush strokey, very modeled, not very, very heavy in color of one or the other. We, it's okay to see the brush marks in other words. Okay, now what I'm going to do is I will clean out that large brush and I'm gonna drop back down to my number 12 flat brush. So let's do that real quickly. So I'm just gonna pinch this one dry and set it aside for a moment. 
I've got the number 12 flat brush. And when we look at the rest of the watermelon here, this rind area is all painted classic green before we add our little checkerboard stripes. So what you're gonna do now is just color book paint in or base coat in with the number 12 flat brush, loaded both sides of the flat brush with our darker green. And again, you're just going to uh, use that chisel edge to the best of your ability to just paint along and create the shape or the area that where our rind is, the watermelon rind. So it's the chisel edge that, and just lightly uh, apply a little bit of pressure and just kind of scoot it along the edge to kind of give yourself a pattern or a line so that you'll know where to come back and fill in. So that's half of my watermelon rind right here. I can turn my project around and do the exact same thing on the opposite side of that rind. Yeah, I'm, talking, I'm trying to make sure I hold it so that you can see. That blue is pretty much dry. So I'm going to hold it and again, use that chisel edge of my brush. And now I've got both edges done. So I can very carefully come back in and paint it with our classic green. If you learn to use your brush and especially the chisel edge like this, it makes it so much easier for you instead of trying to take that brush and paint that line. And so this way it, it, you're kind of basing in the shape of the area that you want to paint and it makes filling it in so much easier. And when I paint, it's best to fill it in and then come back with like a long smooth stroke as you can, if, like I just did. So there's half my rind done. When we get down to the bottom of our canvas here, if you're intending to frame this, I did mine on a canvas panel, which is very thin. If you're intending to frame this, you might lose some of this design down here, depending upon the, how thick the frame edge is that you plan to use. But you'll still want to paint it just in case maybe you put a ribbon on the back and you don't frame it, or maybe it sits on an easel. All right, I'm going on to this side now. Same thing again, I'm using the classic green on my number 12 flat brush. And I'm using that chisel edge of the brush very carefully to determine the line of my rind. Now this is a piece of whimsy, this, this style of uh, folk art here and this painting. So let's say by chance, you don't get a nice smooth edge. Let's say yours is a little wonky. You know what? That is A-OK -okay because we are painting folk art and whimsy tonight. So if yours is a little wonky, I want you to be proud of it and it's not a problem at all. This, as I said in the beginning, is a perfect kind of class. It's perfect for people of all ages and all sizes and all skill levels. I think this is really a fun project. I'm gonna clean my brush now to remove the classic green from my brush because I painted my rind and I'm gonna dry that brush on my paper towel. And now I'm gonna keep this brush out because I think it's a good idea to start working on our polka dots here on the body of the watermelon. And you might not see them when you just see it down here, but let me bring this up so you can see. Our Watermelon has whimsical little polka dots. And maybe they're not so little, medium-sized polka dots, let's say, on our slice here. So those can be painted with um, a color called fire coral that Michaels carries. If you have pink melon, you can use pink melon. It's a color that is very similar to either of those. It's kind of a pinky color. So um, I'm going to go ahead tonight and use the pink melon. But if you have fire coral, I'll pour a little of that out on my palette so you can see the difference maybe in the colors. But you want a color that's similar to either one of these. Let me bring my palette up so you can see the two different pinks. This is pink melon and this is fire coral. So I'm gonna bring them up so you can see this is the color that are one of a color similar to those is what you wanna get out onto your palette now. And we're gonna use that number 12 flat brush and we are going to go ahead and just simply paint in those circles of our polka dots. 
So I'm gonna load both sides of my flat brush. My brush is dry. I did clean it out, but I also pinched out the moisture on my paper towel. So let's go ahead and all of these little polka dots are painted with your pink color, pink melon or fire coral, something like that. Use that chisel edge of the brush again to kind of help smooth some of these strokes. And right now your pink is gonna stand up probably a little bit more than mine does on my finished one, but don't, not to worry. I've got a trick for you at the end here, should you not want that much pink showing on your watermelon slice. How are we doing there, Stephen? Any other questions? I think we're good. Okay. Any other watermelon lovers out there? Yeah, it seems like we've got a lot of people here. Good. You know, I mentioned enjoying watermelon plain or with sugar or salt. I'm wondering if there's another one out there that I'm not aware of if anyone else does something different when they eat their watermelon. Somebody mentioned watermelon uh, balls earlier. It sounds pretty good. Oh, yeah, that would be good. Like using a melon scoop or something to make a ball. Is that what we're talking about? Yeah, I think so. I enjoyed a salad the other night and it had watermelon vinaigrette dressing. I've never heard of that before. And let me tell you, it was delicious. Sounds good. We were talking about our fur babies earlier. I'm wondering if dogs can eat watermelon. This little polka dot that I'm working on right now has a little seed in the middle. So I'm kind of working around the seed a little bit. Now you may not want as many polka dots as I have on mine. Maybe you're painting with fewer polka dots, but you know what? I kind of liked the look of the polka dots and the little touch of whimsy on our watermelon slice tonight. I hope you all are too. Don't forget the ones up at the top of the slice where the, the slice is of the watermelon. There's just a little half of a polka dot kind of showing. There's a polka dot right at where the bite mark is on our slice too. Don't forget that. Got one more to do over here. And I will have all of my polka dots painted in just a moment. And then what I'm going to do is quickly going back to the very first one I did, just kind of use the, the dirty brush, if you will, and kind of fill in and give them just a little bit more pink. So I'm not really purposefully base coating on the second time, I'm just kind of stroking over the first color, kind of evening out that undercoat, that base coat of the pink. And I'm using up the excess paint that's in my brush. When you're going over it the second time, any of these polka dots, you want to, might want to try working the brush in a different direction than you applied the first one. And that might help fill up any of the void areas that you might have. It will also even out any brush stroke work that you might see. So on that second application, when you're running through these dots, just to kind of clean that brush off, go in a different direction to fill in. All right, now I'm on that last polka dot one more time. Okay, I'm happy with my polka dots. So I'm gonna set my canvas down and I'm gonna go ahead and clean out that brush in my water here. And I'm going to squeeze it dry on my paper towel. All right, now let's go back to the body of our watermelon the slice itself. And we're going to do a little bit of shading. I'm gonna bring this up so you all can see. On the body or the meat of the watermelon that's closest to the white section of our rind, where all these little fun scallops are. 
we are going to shade on the body, the scallop area. So what we need to do first is we need to make a darker shading color. So I'm going to add to my palette a little bit of our black tonight. So I'm using licorice. If you don't have licorice, you could use pure black. And I'm going to take my palette knife and I'm going to take a little bit of my apple red. I uh, don't need that much. I'm going to take a little bit of my apple red, move it over here to a clean spot on my palette. And I'm going to use just the tiny, tiny tip of my palette knife to add a little black to it. Not a lot, just a tiny little tip of black. I'm bringing it up and if it will focus. I think you all can see that there's just a little bit of black on this palette knife, not a lot. And I'm going to just a little at a time, add some black to this little puddle of our red. The black is going to create a burgundy color. It won't be as bright a red and it definitely won't be near the pink that we used. And I'm going to add just a tiny bit more black to mine. So I'm gonna wipe my palette knife and I'm gonna tap into my black one more time. Again, being careful not to get too much black because black is a very strong color as you all know, and it can change the value and change your color very, very quickly. Okay, I like what I have here now. I have a really pretty burgundy color. I'll bring it up so you can see it to the uh, camera real quick. As compared to our apple red here, that's a bright, juicy, bright, bright red, by adding the black, we now have a real pretty burgundy. And that's what we're going to use um, on the me um, meat of the watermelon slice right up next to our scallops. So what we want to do is I'm going to, I'll go ahead and use my same number 12 flat brush. I'm gonna load that brush with my base color or my local color, which is our apple red, the full flat of the brush with the apple red. Then I'm going to side load into this mixture that we just made, so the burgundy. So I'm gonna have a brush that has apple red on one side, blending over to the burgundy that we have now on the edge. And with this, I'm going to turn my work so that I'm gonna stroke towards me, keeping the full brush on the full slice or the meat of our watermelon. And I'm going to pat, I wanna make sure you're seeing, I'm gonna pat that dark color right up next to what is the white right now of our scallop. So we're shading the meat of the watermelon. And you don't wanna bring this color too, too far out into the watermelon, but you do wanna shade a little bit. And this just gives you another technique to learning how to kind of work wet on wet using that base color, which is our apple red. And then we are going to side load into our burgundy. And yes, you could have used a burgundy. There's a berry wine. There's all kinds of burgundy colors in the folk art line, but it's also fun to mix colors. So that's why we occasionally have you mix colors within our classes, because then you're learning just a little bit of how to blend the colors, to mix them, to create your own tints and your own tones. And it helps you when you're highlighting and when you're shading. So in this case, we are shading our watermelon slice. And you can see there's just a little bit of shading there on the edges of my watermelon. And I'm gonna continue on doing this on all of the scallops, right up next to the white of the rind. If you are new to the Michaels Community Classroom tonight, welcome. I'm glad you're here with us. We uh, here at Plaid do a lot of the classes at Michaels um, on Tuesday evenings around 7.30 Eastern Standard Time. And uh, we change off quite often uh, with different teachers here that we have in the Plaid Craft uh, area. We have a lot of very talented teachers in our content studio. So you might join us for another one yet down the road. I want to tell you also that if you are new to the show tonight or the class tonight, I want to invite you to join our Facebook group. We have a fabulous learn to paint community called Let's Paint with Plaid. 
And I happen to be one of the admins of the uh, group and we teach classes there all the time. These classes are taught during the lunch hour. We teach them on lunch and learns is what we call it. And it's usually on Tuesdays and Thursdays at noon Eastern Standard Time. These classes are taught as live streams within our group and they're free. So if you're not yet a member of the Let's Paint community, I invite you to join us. It's always a lot of fun. And I think you will enjoy painting with us time and time and time again. We love to see your work. And tonight as people are painting with us, we invite you to after class tonight, take a picture of your piece and post it in the Let's Paint with Plaid Facebook group and use the hashtag Let's Paint Challenge. It's always so fun to see everyone's work. Okay, I finished shading around my scallops and what I did was I just quickly took that number 12 flat brush and I wiped the dark coloring out of it. So in other words, I wiped my brush to remove the apple red and to remove that burgundy mix that we had made. And now I'm using just apple red to lightly pat that color on all onto the rest of the meat area or the flesh area of our watermelon, giving it a second coat. So in other words, I'm doing the same thing we did to start with, but I'm just really kind of putting it on very quickly and easily. I'm not laboring over this. Remember to really let that chisel edge of the brush work for you when you come to those straight edges. I'm using the flat of the brush as I curl around some of the circular shapes of our um, polka dots. And this is just kind of giving us a little bit richer, deeper, maybe more even toned application of the red of our watermelon. You don't have to go on that area at the bottom where you just put the shading because you also had apple red in your brush. Just go up close to that area. This is just giving us a beautiful red coat to our watermelon slice. I'm almost done giving that a second application, but I'm just going to keep working. I think I'm going to need to get a little more apple red out. I am. Give me a moment here. I'm going to get a little more apple red out onto my palette. I just checked my time. We're doing great. Famous last words until we're rushing at the end, right? <laughs> Okay, I'm almost done giving our red its second coat. One thing I want you to see, and I'll show my hero here in just a moment, in the area up here where the little scallop bite marks are on our slice here, I came back with a little bit of pink melon. Let me bring it up so you can see our bite, bite mark here from our slice of watermelon. It's a little bit pinkier on the meat itself. Um, so what I did was I used the same brush and if you have your red in it still, that's quite all right. I'm gonna pick up a little bit of my pink melon and just kind of frost, if you will, kind of frost that or kind of pat that on right up and around the area where these little teeth marks are. If you wanna give yourself a little bit more of a lighter value of meat or flesh of the watermelon. All right, I think I'm good there. Now, I told you all I had a trick if you didn't like the brightness of your pink polka dots. When you look at the two that I have here, these are a little bit more subdued. These are a little bit brighter. So it's totally up to you if you want to leave them like they are now, nice and bright and cheery, or if you want to add a little bit more um, red on top to kind of draw them back down into the meat, you can do that. With that number 12 flat brush, I had some red in it. I'm gonna add just a little bit of water to my brush. With that moisture in my brush, I'm still gonna continue keeping that brush loaded 
with our apple red, but it's now more like a wash of color versus it being a very solid pigment of red like we would if we were base coating. So with this wash of color, if you want to tone down your pink little um, polka dots, you can very lightly, again, use that chisel edge if you're up the edge here, just kind of stroke some of that red on top. And can you see how that set that polka dot back a little bit further? If you want to set your polka dots back, you can go ahead and put a little bit of red on and then wash it over. And let me bring that up so you can see. So when you look at this polka dot, which does not have the apple red on it versus these two, which do have the apple red, it just kind of tones down the brightness of that pink. So if you want to wash a little bit of apple red on top of that pink, by all means do so. This is kind of an optional step. If you by chance you like yours that bright pink, you won't do this. Make sure that you use enough water so that it really is a wash of color. You're not really base coating red on top of pink. You're just applying a wash of that red just to kind of set some of that color back. And I'm going to continue on. If you need to make a little bit more of your wash mixture by adding more water, do that too. And I think I've only got one more to do after this one. I'm kind of just washing over them. And now you can kind of see that my polka dots now are a little bit more subdued and I think that looks pretty. Now what we're going to do is I'm gonna clean out that brush and I'm gonna now concentrate on the rind a little bit before we do our seeds. Now the white of the rind, I'm just gonna leave it the white of my canvas showing through, but I do wanna put a little bit, can you see there's a really bright yellowy green color here next to the green of the rind, but it's on the white of the scallops. So that is our citrus green. So you wanna go ahead and get yourself a little bit of the citrus green out onto your palette. It's a beautiful bright yellowy green color. If you don't have that, lime green would work. It's not quite as yellowy green, but it would work. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to make sure my brush is clean that I don't have any red in my brush. So I did just dampen it in my water, blot it on my paper towel just to check to make sure that there was no red residue in my brush. And what I'm going to do with that dampened brush, I'm gonna pick up a little bit of that citrus green and I'm gonna to come to a clean spot on my palette and I'm just gonna stroke that in. What we're going to do is we're gonna kind of create like a float of color. It's more a wash of color, kind of like we just washed over these uh, yellow, I'm sorry, yellow, these pink polka dots. Well, now we're going to add this light yellowy green color on the white of the rind, right next to the green section of the rind. So I'm just gonna kind of stroke that color on and I turned it upside down so that I could stroke towards me, but let me show you. We're just putting a little bit of a green, yellowy green wash right on the uh, white section of the rind, right up next to the green. Chris, okay? I have a question. Sure. Um, someone asked, my graphite is still really showing through. Uh, do you have any suggestions? Um, I'm thinking that would be maybe over where these yellow, I'm, I'm, why do I want to say yellow, where these polka dots are? Is, could it, that be the section that's showing? Um, yeah. I've, got a I've got a trick for you we can do here at the end. Yeah, let me finish this part of the class. And then when we get ready to do some extra details, I'll show you what you can do. Red and yellow, I keep calling yellow, but reds and yellows are transparent colors. Sometimes oranges are too, and it could be that your red is very transparent. It could be that maybe you could go back and put another coat of red on, but you can also do a trick that I'm gonna show you here at the end. All right, I've, I've put all of the yellowy green now on the white of my scallop, so I'm good with that, but I wanna now start working on 
this green section of our rind. So I wanna take my uh, palette knife, take a little bit of our classic green between the two greens. Now this is the darker of my two greens. Move some of that to a clean spot. And I'm gonna darken this with a little bit of black, just like we darkened our red with a little black. I'm adding licorice to my classic green. And this will give me a very deep green, almost like a thicket or a sap green. If you have that and would rather work with that, that's perfect. If you don't wanna mix the color, just get a darker green out. And I think mine looks pretty good right now. I'm gonna wipe my palette knife. And what I'm going to do is I'm gonna switch down to a little bit smaller brush. I want a less wide stroke. What I'm going to do is fill this brush and I think I've jumped down to a number six. I was working with a 12. If you'd rather work with an eight, that would be fine too. But what we're gonna do is we're going to paint with the darker green coordinating checkerboard stripes here within this checkerboard. And it's just a little bit of whimsy. So it's not exact spacing. Don't worry about trying to make it a half inch all the way around. Just with your brush filled with this darker green mix. And on mine, it almost looks black, but it really is a dark green. I am just going to start on one end of my rind and work all the way around to the opposite end. And I'm just going to paint in stroking towards the edge. So there's one little checkerboard. And then I'm gonna leave a little bit of a gap or a space and I'm gonna put another little one. So it's very, very simply done. Just give yourself a little bit of a space in between each of your checkers. And when you start, now we, we were working going straw all the way off to the edge of the canvas, but now that we're not able to go off the edge of the canvas, if you want to do a couple strokes in this direction, and if you need to turn your work around and from the rind going in towards the white area, stroke that way. So if that helps you to stroke from either edge in, do that. So just leave a little space. And I'm using, I dropped down to a number six. I could have dropped down to an eight and just did it in one stroke, but I'm using a number six. So I'm actually taking two strokes to do each of my little checkers. Is that not just adorable? You know, watermelons have so many different patterns on the rind when you get a whole watermelon and you look at one. Some have lots of different fun designs on them, but I don't know that I've ever seen one that with a checkerboard design. It would be fun to find one in the store though, huh, Stephen? Yeah, it would be. Very quickly, not a lot of detail for this. And it's really kind of a guesstimate. Like I said, there's no math or science to measuring out all of these little stripes or checkers. I think this is a project that you could even do with your kids or maybe even your grandchildren if they enjoy working with you at the table. Taking it one step at a time and maybe a little bit slower. I think it would just be a fun, fun project. And remember, we love to see your work when you are said and done. Join that Let's Paint community. Let's Paint with Plaid is the name of the Facebook group. Take a picture of your project, post it in our group, and use the hashtag Let's Paint Challenge, all one word, no apostrophe. You could also tag Michaels, and you would tag it with uh, Make It With Michaels or Michaels Classes. All of us love to see your work and be a cheerleader for you to help cheer you on in your learn to paint journey. Okay, I think I've got enough checkers on mine. Let me bring it up so you can see. I've got checkers on this side, a little tiny skimmer, a little bit of checker across the bottom and then checkers up to the, as you're looking at it, the right side. All right, now what I wanna do really quickly <clears throat> is let's go ahead and put some black 
seeds on. So you can use um, either your liner brush if you want to, to paint in the whole shape of the seed, but you can also use this small flat brush that I was just using. Again, it's a number six small flat. The seeds are all painted black. When you look at the seeds or look at the pattern that you have, you'll notice that it's almost kind of like a teardrop. They're fatter here at the bottom and they go up more to a point or skinny at the top. So I'm gonna start here on what would be the base of each of these and I'm gonna stroke up towards the skinny part. So with that flat brush, again, I used a number six flat brush and I have just the solid black or, or licorice, pure black, on my uh, brush, I am going to uh, do a simple little stroke. So you can do a couple different things. I'll give you a couple different techniques. You can start here at the bottom and pull up on one side, pulling up toward and lifting to release pressure to get skinny on the tip. And then you can turn it around and you can do the same thing on the other side, releasing pressure to kind of get skinny on the tip and then fill in. So there's one seed, that's one way to do it. You can also take that flat brush and instead of using it flat this way, flat, turn the brush on up so that it's upright. And what you're gonna do is work with the corner, <clears throat> excuse me, a corner of that brush. So I've got that brush upright with a corner ready to touch down. And I'm gonna to touch down again on the fat part of my stroke and I'm gonna apply pressure. That's gonna make these bristles fan out. And then I'm gonna start releasing pressure until I bring it up to that point. So that's another way you can make a seed. You can also, like I said earlier, you can use your liner brush. Here's mine. Fill that with your black paint and you can simply paint that teardrop with a fatter area at the bottom and lighter where at the tip or the end of the seed. So I want you to find the comfort level that is, is best for you and go ahead and paint in all of your seeds. That's our next step. So you want to your black on your flat brush, and I want you to paint in your seeds. Now we do have a little trim on our seed and we'll do that once the black is dry. There's nothing really difficult about this part. You're just basically kind of color book painting in the shapes of your seeds. If by chance you lost your shape, your seed shape, sorry, uh, you can use your pattern and trace it back on, or you can take a pencil and just kind of sketch the design or the pattern of a seed. And if one seed's bigger than another, I don't think that's a problem at all because in a watermelon, no two seeds are probably the same anyway. So this is a very fun, carefree kind of painting. Like I said earlier, kind of whimsical. I'm gonna come back and put a little red next to that last one I painted because I think it's a little bit too fat at the tip. So this is where you can kind of adjust some of your pattern to. I just felt like I left my seed a little bit too fat here. So I'm just gonna come in and put a little bit of the red up next to my block. There we go. And I've got one more seed yet to do over here on this end. And then once I said, like I said, once our seeds are dry, we're gonna add a little bit of a highlight stroke on them. So let's let that black of our seeds now dry. So while we're letting the black of our seeds dry, let's go ahead and still keep working with our black. And we're gonna to switch to our liner brush. So what I wanna show you on my hero here, there is a black line. So we're gonna use our liner brush. We're gonna thin our black down with a little bit of water so that it flows nicely off of our liner brushes for us. And what we're going to do is we are going to um, outline the top edge of our slice. We're gonna outline where the white scallop meets the red of the body. 
we're going to outline both sides of the green rind. And that's all done with your liner brush. We're going to thin down the black to let it flow for you. Now, some of you are like, I'm so scared of working with a liner brush. Well, you might be asking me, can I use a permanent marker? And I'll let you do that if that's easier for you. But it does help to keep practicing with your liner brush and with your paint consistency, making sure you get it right. The more you practice at something, the easier it becomes for you. And I think you'll enjoy it that much more. If you are using a marker though tonight, make sure that your marker um, is permanent so that if you put a finish on top of it, it doesn't bleed into your painting. The other thing to think about too, is to make sure that your painting and the acrylic paint is completely dry before you put your marker on top. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and use my liner brush. I've thinned down my black paint with some water. So I'm using just the tip of my brush so that it is just barely touching my surface. And I made a little bit of a line here at the end, right on this side right here. Now I'm getting ready to do the scallops of my bite. And again, I'm using just the tip of my brush and do one little scallop at a time if that's easier for you, rather than trying to do like one great big long line. And you can just neatly and carefully make the bite mark here of our watermelon. And then if you want to on this, because this is a long distance to make a straight line, break it up. Go from here to maybe the first polka dot. If that's, oops, I got my hands in my black seeds. Be careful not to do what I just did. <laughs> Let me take some water and get that up real quick. I was trying to be careful to show you up close what I was doing. I didn't realize my hand was going in my canvas. Sorry about that. If you catch your mistake right away, you can get that up with a little bit of water on your paintbrush just like I did there. And you'd never know that I got my hand in my black paint. Okay, now I'm gonna be a little more careful. And so what I was saying is you can take the line from here up to your first polka dot, then take it across the polka dot and then go to the next polka dot. If it's easier for you to work a shorter distance, you could even go to this polka dot and stop. So I'm gonna put my work down so I can balance myself. And like I said, you can go to the first polka dot. So there's up to my first polka dot. If that makes it easier for you to break down these sections rather than trying to do it all at one time. And when I do line work like this, if you're practicing your line work, the best thing to do is to not watch the tip of your bristles, not watch where you're working here, but keep your eyes ahead. Keep your eyes ahead on um, like the eye has to be following whatever it is that your, your hand is following whatever your eye is looking at, if that makes sense. So now we put the stripe across the top. Let's go ahead and stripe our little scallop area. And so I'm gonna do one scallop at a time. That might be easier for our folks that are beginners with the liner brush. And this just kind of helps add to the whimsy of our watermelon. And it also kind of beautifully separates our two colors, our two areas, the rind and the um, fruit itself. Now you could make a one long scalloped edge if you wanted to. I'm just showing you that this might be easier for someone who's never worked with a liner brush before and just do a scallop at a time. Occasionally stop and refill your brush as you feel like you need to. And the key thing when you're doing liner work like this is making sure that your brush is full of the proper consistency of paint. And when I say proper, I mean, it must really be thinned paint so that it's nice and fluid and that the paint will flow from your paintbrush beautifully. Our folk art acrylics are so thick, rich, and creamy in consistency as they come out of the bottle, and they will not work well 
on a liner brush for this type of work unless you thin it down with some water. All right, now when you get ready to stripe the edges of our green stripe, you can do a long distance pull if you can, <clears throat> or break it down and just do a couple checkers at a time. Keeping your eye ahead of where you're going, just look at a couple checkers. These little green checkers that you've already painted are giving you the guideline to do your line work. So let's say you're only going to go maybe two, maybe three checkers at a time, and then stop and refill your brush. Take a deep breath and keep working so that you're only working sections of this liner work. It kind of cuts it down to make it a lot easier for you. And I am almost done with one edge of my green. And now I'm going to repeat with the outside edge of my green rind. <clears throat> and again, just work a couple check checkers distance at a time. Stop, refill your brush, readjust your um, canvas, readjust your eyes to the shape or the direction that you're headed in. And this one, because it's falling off the bottom of our canvas, we don't really have to worry about the bottom of our rind. And there we go. So now what we've done is we have outlined <clears throat> around the bite mark, across the top of our uh, watermelon slice, around the scallops of the white of the rind, and then on both sides of the green of the rind, okay? Now for someone earlier that said that they could still see their uh, graphite lines around these polka dots, another option for you would be to maybe take that liner brush with the black and you can outline these circles. But let me tell you, it's much, much easier if you don't out try and make a nice, clean, crisp circle, okay? Maybe what you do is around this uh, pink polka dot that we have here, maybe you kind of do like a little wiggly line like this, because that too adds to whimsy. So I'll do that on mine here so that you can see what I'm talking about. And I think that will help camouflage the graphite line that you might see. So let's do it right here on this one in the center where I have a little bit of a seed here. And I'm going to add just a little bit of black. And I'm making that brush kind of go really wiggly, jiggly around it. Can you see that one? I'm bringing it up right now. That to me also kind of makes it look cute. So you could even, even if you don't see your graphite lines, you could do that on yours because I think that will just add a little bit of whimsy. We'll also tie in with the black that we've been doing. And I think that might be a fun way to kind of, we didn't make a mistake. We didn't make a mistake in that we can still see our graphite lines. We just had an opportunity to make a design change. So I'll show you these couple ones that I've just done. And I think, oh, I think that's just as cute. So can you see I added some black lines around one, two, three, four of these dots. That just kind of adds a little bit more whimsy to our look. So that's something you can do for the person that had that problem. The next thing I want to do is start talking about our lettering. So we're going to clean out the black that's in our brush right now. And let's talk about sweet. The word sweet at the top. You want to make sure your black is completely out of your liner brush because you're going to need to use that liner brush. And when we look at the word sweet up here, it is just simply painted solid with our aqua color. So we're going to take our liner brush. I am going to put a little bit of moisture to that uh, aqua and thin it down a little bit. We're not really doing line work, but we do want the paint to kind of flow nicely from our brush. So I'm going to turn mine upside down so I don't get my hand in my wet paint there. And I've got my br liner brush filled with thinned aqua. 
and I'm, I'm working upside down on the letter T. I'm gonna start here at the base of the letter and I can still see my pattern lines through what we did as our sky. If by chance you don't, you go ahead and take a moment because this is all dry now and transfer your pattern back so that you can see the lettering and the words that you have there. So there is T. So I'll just real quickly, I'm gonna do another letter and we'll do an E. And I'm just using my liner brush. And again, I thin down my aqua paint a little bit so that it will flow for me from the paintbrush using the tip of my liner brush. And I have an E. Real quickly, I'm gonna add another E. And then I'm going to pull the vertical part of my letter corner, down to corner. So we have T-E-E, -E, working backwards here. I'm gonna work on my W next. And I'm adding my uh, more paint to my brush every time I feel like it's starting to get a little bit of dry. And I'm gonna add a little bit more to my W here. Thinning down my paint a little bit with a little bit more water and my S upside down. You've got two uh, sides of your S. In other words, you could do one stroke on the left side, one stroke on the right side, and then kind of fill in. That's how you could do actually all of your letters. Okay. So now my word sweet is all done. I think I'm gonna fatten up the top of this one here. Make it a little bit just like that one. So now the word summer, we're gonna go ahead and paint the whole word all with our aqua first. So I'm going to use, I'm gonna turn mine upside down still. I'm gonna use my liner brush still and I'm gonna go ahead and paint my S. And I am going to uh, use that liner brush and apply some pressure to kind of make that brush fan out a little bit to fill in the wide areas of our letter S. And our letter, or I should say our word summer has an ombre effect to it. So we're gonna start with the aqua as our base. So I'm just gonna kind of fill this in quickly and I'll do one more letter and then we'll go back to doing the a detail here on this word. The aqua and the red are so pretty together on this particular color palette. I'm going to come back here at the opposite end of our S, the tail, I should say, and bring the curl here at the bottom around. It kind of fills up our bite shoe marks here on our slice. Uh, Chris, can you repeat what you did to your aqua? Yes, this aqua um, is just the solid color of the paint straight as it comes from the bottle. But I am using my liner brush. And anytime I use a liner brush and I want that paint to be able to move quickly or flu more fluid, I add a little bit of water to my brush or to my paint. So that's all I did was I dipped my brush into the water, brought it over to the puddle of the paint and I thinned it down just a little bit. Not like as thin as if I was doing all the black line work that we did, but I did want that paint to be a little bit more fluid and I wanted it to flow easy to paint out each of these words or these letters. And that's exactly what I did for the word sweet. And now we're doing it for our word summer. So I'm gonna do one more letter and then that's give this time to dry and I'll show you how we're gonna do that ombre effect. So I'm going to start up and like you have this pattern. So just go ahead, it's just kind of coloring in. We're not worrying about brush stroke lettering or anything like that. We're just basically kind of coloring in the shape of each of these letters. And if it helps you to use the liner brush to paint one side, and then paint the other side, like in other words, go down the left side of the letter. 
then go down the right side of the letter and then fill it in in between. I think that is perfectly fine. As a matter of fact, that might be the easiest way for most people to paint each of these letters. The word summer is almost sitting on top of our slice. And I'm gonna go ahead and after maybe after, let's see, is it almost dry? Yes, yeah, almost dry. I'll finish our letter M here. When you wanna do very thin strokes, you're using just the very tip of the liner brush with very little pressure. And when you want to do the thicker strokes, like filling in the letters, you might go ahead and put a little bit more pressure on your brush because those bristles will fan out with the pressure and it gives you a little bit wider stroke. Okay, I said I was gonna stop at the one M, but I'm on to the second M now. Let me do this M and then we'll go back to our S and I'll show you how we're going to achieve that ombre look. Okay, so what you're going to do is continue with the ER in this same technique using your liner brush with your thinned aqua paint. There's no need to come back and put a second coat on. One coat is plenty. So what we're going to do now is we're gonna come back to this dark green mixture that we made. I'm gonna wipe some of that aqua out of my brush. That dark green mixture was a combination of our classic green plus a little bit of our licorice. And what I'm gonna do now is just fill that liner brush with some of that dark green mixture. And I'm gonna bring this up so you can see what I'm gonna talk about. We're gonna turn our work up. Well, first of all, let's see, can you see it's darker here at the base of each of our letters? And then it goes lighter towards the top. So what I'm gonna do is turn this around and I want you to see that there's that dark green at the base of each of those letters. So we're gonna start here on our S and we're just gonna bring in some of this dark green color at the base or the bottom and stroke up and then don't do a complete dead stop halfway through. Let it kind of blend in on the S as it goes up. And then we'll do the same thing with each of our other letters. And if it's easier for you to do one of the thinner words or letters first, then by all means do so. So on this, we got S-U-M-M -M is what I have so far on mine. So if you were gonna do that M and you wanted to try this on the thinner stroke first, just at the base of the letter and you're gonna pull up and lift. The base of the letter, pull up and then lift. You want it to kind of drag a little bit so it's an uneven end as it ombres up the letter. So we're gonna start at the base of this and we're gonna pull up and lift. Start at the base, pull up and lift. So that's what we're doing to kind of create this ombre effect on the bottom of each of our little letters here. I left sweet, just, just solid the turquoise. Do not worry about that. But here on our S, we've got a lot of space here at the bottom. So you could even, if you wanted to, switch to a uh, flat brush. I'm just starting at the bottom and I worked up a little bit up on this side. Now, when I come around to the fat part, I'm gonna join where I started there and I'm gonna pull around and lift. I'm gonna do the same thing again here. We're gonna pull it around and lift. So we're kind of letting the edges drag a little bit, if you will. So it's not a complete dead stop of our color. And it really is better sometimes to do this. Um, you can do it wet on wet, but I think for a beginner, it might be easier to let you make sure that your aqua is dry before you continue on with this step. I'm gonna add a little bit of water to mine because mine's starting to dry up. So if you need to make new green, remember that was classic green plus our licorice. And I'll bring some up on this side. And that's how we get the ombre darker at the bottom of each of these letters. And it's just aqua at the top. I did not even come back and lighten the top. I just let the aqua be our lightness there. So if I were to continue here on this next M, 
I would just start at the base of that letter and pull up the base of the middle section here and then pull up and then connect over and then pull up. So that's all there is to doing the ombre of the letters. And that my friends, if we were to, let's see, how's our timing? Let's see. Oh, okay. I think we're pretty close. That's how I would finish doing all of my lettering. So um, I'll take, hold this up real quick so that you can see sweet is just solid aqua. Summer is painted solid aqua, but then we took our dark green mix, which was a combination of our classic green plus our licorice. And as you just saw me demonstrate, I turned my brush upside down and I pulled up. One more thing I did on this large word, large letters of summer was if you look on my letters and this could be optional, you don't necessarily have to do this, but if you look at them on the left and the bottom side of each letter, I did come back and do a little line work. And that can be your dark green, but it also can be that licorice. So let me get my brush filled with some licorice and I'll show you this option. It just adds a little bit of a finishing touch to lettering when you do brush lettering or adds any trim to things. So here is an S, let me hold the two up together. Here is an S that has that black line work on the left side and the bottom of the letter. And here's one that does not. So can you see the difference between the two? It's not a big difference, it's not tremendous, but it does give you just a little bit more of a finished look. So if you wanted to, you could on the bottom, so I'm holding mine upside down. So I'm going on the bottom part of this stroke right here and I'm bringing a little bit of our black there and I'm stopping. So on this one, the bottom part would be lining up here with our green and bringing it up and then we're also talking about doing the left side of things. So I'm going to start up here and bring it around to the bottom and stop. And then on the left side here of our tail. So we're gonna come around here. So on the left side and the bottom of each of my letters is where I came back and I did that extra line work. Again, that's optional, you don't have to. The only other thing I did to my um, watermelon is the highlight on the seeds. And let me show you the hero here while I'm getting my brush ready. The seeds have just a little bit of a white glint or a white highlight. And I put it all on the same side of each of my seeds. And as you're looking at the seeds, I put it on the right side. I started my stroke at the fat part of the seed and I pulled up towards the skinny tip. So it's a, just a fluid white. So I added some water to my puddle of white on my liner brush and I'm on the uh, right side of every seed. Beginning here at the base, I touched down and pulled up towards the tip. Touched down, pulled up towards the tip. This just adds a little bit of a highlight on our seeds. And I think, I mean, you don't have to do this, but I think it is necessary. I think it just adds another little bit of a finishing touch to your project. And once you get those highlights on, I think that is the end of our lesson tonight. I'm gonna bring this up to the camera one more time, my heroes. So if you wanna take a quick snapshot, you're welcome to. This will give you an idea of how to finish yours. Any last minute questions, Stephen? Uh, no last minute questions, but everyone's saying thank you for a wonderful class. Oh, that's great. Well, thank you, everyone. I hope you all enjoyed sweet summer. And like I said, I can't wait to see your project, your painting. Um, be sure and use the hashtag Let's Paint Challenge so that we can all find them. Join our Facebook group, Let's Paint with Plaid. And uh, until another class, Stephen and I here at Plaid both sign off and say thank you both so much for attending tonight. Good night.